to Sheffield, which actually has nothing to do with oral history, but in a previous life, I, um, that's what I worked in for about 12 years, um, right from the early days in the sort of 1990s with the cassette tapes and the um, recording machines that you had to take a wheelbarrow to get from place to place. Um, so I, I'm, I feel very strongly about oral history and its importance and, and how it is useful and important on all kinds of levels. Um, because before the advent of modern media, um, history is what's written down. And that means it's mediated through people who can communicate effectively in writing. Whether they are telling you, uh, one of my um, uh, politics professors at the University of once said, Winston Churchill is the only man who can write a family history and call it the history of the English speaking people. <laughs> um, that kind of person who can write their own um, version of history. Or whether they're actually mediating the history that they're being told by other people and they're putting it into proper English and putting it on the written page for us. Um, which, is, which is great, you know, that they're working with the media, the, the media that they've got. We've got media now that enables us to collect people actually talking about their own experiences. And there's lots of different layers to that. Firstly, the obvious one, which is you're actually listening to the way they speak, where they come from, uh, their accents, and so on, uh, which um, the uh, language departments find particularly interesting. And particularly now when they're losing all region or become Americanese, um, that it quite quickly is going to become something that is quite important. And it's also, it's something like ninety percent of human communication is is sort of um, body language and listening to people and talking to people. It's it's um, it's non it, it's non verbal, but in the voice and just listening to the voice, you can feel and get more meanings than you can just from as I say, writing, writing down. But the main thing, of course, about oral history is is access to people who would not normally have access to direct. Uh, communicating their experiences to us. And I'm talking about oral history now, not reminiscence work or end of life work, that kind of thing, which tends to be more for certainly more useful for the person who's speaking it, um, useful for various therapies or whatever. Oral history is for our purposes, for academic purposes although, going in to collect um, history that we are interested in. And yeah. um, so you've got a project, you've got a um, a photo of what you know what it is you're trying to uh, talk to people about. But on the other hand, you then let them talk to you, and amazing things come out of that. With very rare exceptions, all the projects I've, I've worked in with a variety of communities, <coughs> most of the people I've talked to initially said to me, Well, I don't like them to talk to me because I have something interesting to say. And then all these amazing things come out. And you can talk, you, you gather from that individual stories individual ways that um, people have had interesting lives, but also they come together into make the big picture. Um, we're not talking about truth any more than we'd be talking about truth if it was written by, written down by whoever. Um, there's no such thing as that kind of truth. So um, you do get down to some really nitty gritty and some things that would never would never otherwise would otherwise be able to collect. Uh, and it's also a very empowering thing for the people you're talking to. And some of the projects I've, I've worked in have been set up just to do that, just to empower people right? for the community who've been disassociated from their landscape by industry. Um, and the Laura History Project was set up to reconnect them with that, which is their own heritage and their own history. So I'm more interested to show you how we grew the cotton and how it's been produced and disposed it of for same purpose. This is the history where the red dot, the red color, is the one called Sindhu Valley. That's where cotton has been produced initially, which was about uh, 5,000 years BC. And then that Time, even in ancient time, they used to use this cotton to make a wick, to light, and do the prayers. So, so this is the wick, and uh, they used to put the clothes to the gods and decorate them as well. 
So this has been used since ancient time. What a story now. There are small pictures. This is how we grow the cotton. Usually it takes about six to seven months before we get to produce cotton. So it's happening during monsoon. Monsoon they put these seeds and then it slowly grows. Once it's grown, it becomes a, like a capsule, green capsule. Depends upon the size and breed. Nowadays we get a very high breed. But in originally they were very small capsules, which makes the cotton inside. This is the cotton inside capsule. And then the cotton is all over the field. It looks like this. The field looks like a white carpet. <laughs> we, when we were young, even I was very young, I used to go and pick up the cotton, make some pennies for my slate and pen. <laughs> and uh, so this is not a child labor, this is a little kid going to collect it so that she can have some pocket money. But we used to enjoy having a fresh air, pick up, become very proud how much I have collected the cotton. And they used to pay according to the weight of the cotton. And cotton is stored in either in the house or in a storeroom. We had a house that was one room where we used to put all water. And then obviously, because it's fluffy, you have to walk on it, press on it, so that you can store more cotton. So that's another thing we used to enjoy by walking on this cotton <laughs> and storing it. And from there, it been transported with the bullock cart. There is a bull, there are two bulls and a big cart being pulled out. You might wonder what's the difference between bullock and bull. The bullock is a castrated bull so that we can domesticate him. And during that time in farming, this is I'm talking about early 40s, mid 40s, when they, they used to carry this uh, water to the city. I used to live in a right remote part of the India, and it's 12 miles before we go to near town where we can sell this cotton. So this bullock has to travel 12 miles and then we send it. But the time has grown. Now they have a they have a mechanical transportation. So this is the in the truck they fill it up and transport it the cotton to the gene. They, we used to call it gene. Gene is the place where they separate the seeds and the cotton and we manage the cotton, but we used to at home also do it manually. We have a, like a bow kind of thing which was hang on the on the ceiling, and they they used to just there is a string. They used to just tap the string on the cotton, and cotton gets separated, and that's how we used to do that. This is why we have our own beddings, our own ID garden, and everything. We used to make it at home just to last for ourselves and then raise cotton goes to sell. And this is the cotton with the seeds. Looks like this. And that was the cotton, cotton story. <coughs> if you want to ask any question and pick it up, it's nice sunshine summer. So it became light and cotton become fluffy. So you just pick it up easily. There is a bag in the back. So you just put it in the bag and collect it that way. I was just going to ask something. When you, was that a whole family thing? When all of you were separate and the founders of the company it's for yourselves? The whole family okay. help each other. Because when we had a tradition that farmer's son become farmer. I, I, goes and that's saying. why I escaped actually. My mother was very <laughs> forward. She said, no, the land, we got only, say, 50 acre land and four brothers to, to divide them. Mm -hmm. By the time you have grandchildren, there, there is no land left. So my mother pushed us out to educate. Good. That's how I became educated. Thank you. Can I, can I just add to what Dr. Patel has said? I come from uh, South Gujarat. He comes from Central Gujarat. Yeah. Another 100, 150 miles south of where he was. I was born in a village where cotton was produced by small farmers and in similar fashion collected by 
provided quite good labor, uh, income for labor. But they were all very small farmers, and it, was, it is probably very lucky, collected, and stood. And like him, we used to love jumping on, on the coffee to press it down. Because this was a cash crop that small farmers used. My grandfather was a farmer, my father wasn't. And uh, as well as uh, sending that to Ginnelis, therefore, there was some uh, cotton production. Within one mile of where I was born, there were two cotton mills in there. And they produced some cloth, but not fine cloth, because the British, of course, they wanted to import the cotton for yeah, producing cotton for export, as has been mentioned. But the, the cotton that was produced was for local consumption. Uh, and the other thing that uh, I want to add is that Ahmedabad, which is the capital of Gujarat state now, had something like 80 mills at once at one time. It was called Manchester of India. So most of the cotton, cotton either was uh, spun into yarn or, or thread and exported to this country for further making of it. Is there any time to contribute or probably to the talk here, especially on such an auspicious occasion? Um, perhaps not many people are aware that uh, this weekend is also a, a major festival for us. It's a Vaishaki festival. It's also been Goli New Year festival. Uh, right. Um, it's okay, it's okay. I didn't really bring any slides to show you, so it's nice in a way. But here we've got uh, an, an artifact. But I do have another artifact which I'll, I'll reveal in a moment. Um, I'm not a cotton expert in any way, so uh, what I have to say is really going to be rather idiosyncratic, I think. Uh, about maybe certain episodes in my life when there were contributions of one kind or another. Um, as Chamu has already said, I was brought up in many different countries. Um, this came about because my father worked for the Indian Foreign Service. Um, but of those countries, if I can just pick three that I think are, are major names in connection with cotton then. India, of course. Uh, where I was born, um, and as we know, one of the largest um, and oldest producers of cotton in the world, and also still today, the largest uh, producer of um, cot uh, cotton as a cottage industry. And, uh, and for that, we have to largely thank Mahatma Gandhi, because he was certainly instrumental um, in the revival uh, of the cottage industry, uh, cotton, in the modern times. Um, and then Egypt, of course, world-renowned for the quality of its cotton. Um, and, and of course, the United Kingdom, uh, England, uh, where we had the first uh, mechanization uh, of cotton and, uh, and uh, cotton uh, leading the way uh, in the Industrial Revolution. Well. Uh, India then. Um, many of you will know that uh, I'm a poet, writer, storyteller, and India has given the world uh, a wealth of stories. Um, so among those stories that I grew up with are also stories that involve cotton one way or another, the spinning of cotton, the weaving of cotton. And as a, as a poet, for me, a lot of my heroes um, are poets heroes and heroines, and one of them was Kabir, uh, the great uh, weaver saint of North India. And uh, he was um, born in a, well, he, he grew up in a Muslim family um, and had a Hindu guru. And, uh, and as a weaver himself, he reminded us uh, that God is a weaver God has woven this wonderful, rich tapestry uh, of creation. And one of Kabir's uh, very famous poems develops the metaphor uh, of the Jindi chador, um, or intricate uh, chador or shawl. The, the word chador is a shawl or a light blanket. And in this poem, 
uh, he talks about um, cosmic existence as being uh, a rich and intricate chador. Um, and so with God having woven uh, the, exist uh, the, the creation that we see around us, it's a reminder then that uh, there is that thread of connection, which is of course the title of today's um, workshop, as you know, a thread of connection that runs through each and every uh, being, each and every thing in the universe. It connects the past with the present or the future. <coughs> And it's also a very powerful connection, uh, connecting thread between God, the creator, Satan, the destroyer, and um, his or her universe. Um, through the connection, the connecting thread being love, um, particularly for Kabir, who was what we would call a Bhakti poet. And among the stories of Kabir, uh, there is a story um, that the Savior God, um, Krishna in this particular case, so Krishna as an incarnation of Vishnu, the Savior, so loved uh, his devotee, Kabir, that Krishna presented him with a piece of woven material. And uh, we are told that this was the, um, that the whole of Kashi, the holy city of Kashi, which we today call Varanasi and which the British called uh, Benares, had never seen um, material, a uh, cotton of this kind before because it was in all the rainbow colors and it was shot through, it was woven, uh, it was a mixture of cotton and sunshine. Um, so that's one of the stories of Kabir, but another story which is a very famous folk tale uh, from Bengal is the story of Sukhu and Duku. Um, it comes from a collection called Takumar Juli. Uh, which was uh, compiled by, um, let me see, um, it's, it's rather a, a long name here, uh, Dakshinaranjan uh, Dakshina Mitra was the compiler of Takumar Chuli. And uh, one of those stories, as I say, is the story of Shuku and Duku. As a child, when I was about 10 or 11, I remember that like Duku, the, uh, the, the main character in that folk tale, I too used to run in the wind. I would run chasing after these uh, bits of cotton uh, fluff that would fly around. And this was not in one of the major cotton growing parts of India. It was not Gujarat, it was not Bengal, but Delhi, the capital. And, um, but in the cotton, in the season, the late summer, I would say, there would be these bits of cotton flying about in the air. And each of these little round balls of cotton would have that, uh, at the center would be a little black cotton seed. And I would run after these, collect them, and gather some of them, squeeze them into a ball, and I would bring them to my mother, and I'd ask her to stuff them into a pillow for me. Um, not perhaps the very comfortable pillow, because of all the little seeds in them. Um, but anyway, so that is um, certainly one connection that I can remember to do with uh, uh, the times when I was growing up in India. Now, moving on to Egypt, uh, it was 1968 when my father was uh, transferred to the, the Indian Embassy in Cairo, and uh, I was 15 at the time, uh, nearly 16, and uh, I enrolled at the American University in Cairo. Now, I was thrilled when my father was posted to Egypt because um, India and ancient Egypt have always had a huge affinity. I would say cultural, artistic, religious, linguistic. It's a huge affinity which uh, sometimes I think people are not as aware as perhaps we should be. Um, certainly in ancient times, uh, one of our ancient uh, scriptures, the Skanda Purana, uh, talks about Egypt and Africa uh, as Sanchadipa. And it's well known that in ancient times, um, port towns like Alexandria uh, in Egypt um, had plenty of Indian scholars. And, uh, and Indian cotton, of course, was being traded from ancient times, uh, particularly Mesopotamia and then through Mesopotamia also, Egypt and other parts of the world. Um, 
So you might be wondering about the carbon connection here. Um, well, when I was at the American University in Cairo, I majored in English literature with comparative literature and um, theater studies as a minor. But what I discovered was, with it being an American university, we had a liberal arts program, and therefore we were introduced to modules in so many different subjects, anthropology, economics. And one of them, to my great delight, was the science and technology of ancient Egypt. And within the science and technology of ancient Egypt, uh, I learned the 13 steps of mummification which of course you'll agree with me was a hugely practical subject to learn about. But, um, so, so I just thought I'd throw this in because just to show you the many innovative ways in which cotton is used and was used even in ancient times. So I learned that in mummifying a body, and it took about 70 days to do this, but in the different uh, steps of mummification, it involves stuffing the cavities of the body with cotton, but cotton also impregnated with different kinds of salts and herbs and sawdust and sand, um, and also the different bodily orifices and so on, stuffed with cotton, uh, and cotton particularly from India. Uh, and then, of course, the body would be lightly wrapped in a uh, linen layer, <coughs> and then those uh, cotton layers would then be uh, coated with uh, a resinous coating and then again the body would uh, be finally wrapped in the bandages that we are familiar with uh, as mummies um, are, are covered in these bandages so these again would be Indian cotton. Um, so yes, so that's, that's an Egyptian uh, uh, an Egyptian connection with cotton as you you will have gathered. And then 1972, the autumn of 1972, uh, I moved to, to England. Um, I'd always wanted to come to England because um, I was very fond of English literature, and of course I did that as an undergraduate in English literature. And so I knew that someday I would be coming here to further my studies um, in English literature. So I came to Kent and Canterbury University where I did my master's in English and American Literature. And after one year, I felt no, one year had not been enough of an experience of this country, not by a long way. Um, so with Kent and Canterbury being right down south, I then went to the north. I went to Lancaster University to do my PhD. While at Lancaster, uh, I used to teach comparative religion. Um, in Manchester uh, at Didsbury College of Education, which is now part of Manchester University. And uh, so, of course, Manchester and Lancashire itself, uh, with their cotton connection, uh, it all really came home to me when I met my, the man who is now my husband, Brian Darcy, because it was in Lancaster that I met Brian. Uh, and uh, there's another interesting Indian, Indian English, if you like, Indian English Irish connection there, because uh, I, I then learned that uh, Brian Darcy's father, William Darcy, had died in India during the Second World War. William Darcy had been um, in India, died, uh, uh, and was initially buried in Barrackpore in Bengal, uh, which is my, well, Bengal is my cultural home. Um, and then the body was later moved to Ranchi, uh, to a military cemetery. Um, and then I met Brian's mother, and, uh, and I learned uh, more about this connection, and in particular with cotton. Uh, Brian's mother, uh, Lorinia Darcy, uh, was one of these people who worked in the cotton mills in Lancashire. And, uh, and of course it was while in Lancaster, Lancaster University, that I also, for the first time, really thoroughly uh, studied and researched uh, Mahatma Gandhi's writings. Um, he'd always been a vague hero of mine, but I really hadn't, uh, didn't know very much about him until, um, until I became a PhD student there. 
And I learned about um, Gandhi's connection, and in particular the work he did around cotton, and how he came to Lancashire in particular, and um, addressed large <coughs> gatherings of uh, workers in the cotton industries uh, in Lancashire. Uh, and many of these were very poor people who were badly exploited themselves by the mill owners. But uh, uh, I think that's part of the celebration. <laughs> 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 but the have all got big flags out there. Oh, yes. That's what I'm saying, we all got this big flags. That's exactly what we're doing yeah. in here. We go around, you know, processions and so on. It's the weather's warm, man. Okay. <laughs> Right, so back to Lancashire and Gandhi delivering the um, addresses to various uh, cotton workers. And, uh, and I like to think that maybe my, my mother in law was one of those people um, in the crowd listening to Gandhi. And uh, in spite of the fact that what Gandhi did, uh, urging people in India to boycott uh, British manufactured cloth, and which of course did deliver a huge blow to the uh, cotton industry in Britain. And it meant that in turn, uh, it meant that the, um, that the poor cotton workers in Lancashire, um, of course, were going to lose their livelihood because of Indians boycotting their cloth. Uh, nevertheless, um, the cotton workers uh, in, in England did uh, take Gandhi to their hearts and they did show an enormous degree of solidarity with what Gandhi was talking about and with the exploited people in India. So there was that huge connection drawn there. And um, so I learned that my mother-in-law had been, because she, she was extremely poor after her, particularly after her husband died in India, um, an incredible and indomitable woman who had three husbands, saw three husbands to their graves. So the first was Irish, who died in India. Her second husband, in fact, was the mill owner. So he was um, one of these rich people who, who owned, um, in, in this particular case, John Hay, who owned uh, cotton mills in Baker, uh, where my mother-in-law worked, and also in St. Anne's. Um, so she married him, and just as an aside, her third, third husband was Scottish. Um, so, so yes, so those were all the different connections, really. Um, and then I found myself um, in, in Sheffield, um, in Yorkshire, um, after my PhD, uh, working in the steel industry, which then became the next big thing to take up um, many of the uh, the manufacturing bases that were cotton to begin with, and uh, and where many of the people from the subcontinent would initially also come to work in the cotton mills. There were many people working from India as well in the cotton mills here, and uh, who then moved on to work in the steel um, industry. So, so that's it, folks. Uh, India, Egypt, uh, England. But I can't say that that's the end because. Um, it has to be a continuing story, I think, like all oral history stories are. It's a, and I hope, a never-ending story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because the East India Company never used to supply the white amount of uniforms to the right sizes and things. Um, she was a poor woman who married a Scottish soldier and she came over here. But Obviously, Britain was in a depression itself at the time, so she took wandering people sewing. Um, and I think she's taught well, my grandmother as well, and all the women and the men in the family to sew, including myself. We still have our skill set. And the fact that she also helped to start up a group for Asian women in this country called the White Star Group. She was one of the founder members in Glasgow. Uh, when immigrants were coming over, they had no food, no pots, no pans, nothing. They would strip off the boat into minus 10 in really harsh conditions in Glasgow where it's still not as friendly as it should be even to this day. But our story is just one of bringing up all our children, all our daughters, and surviving just for the sheer fact that she knew how to use cotton 
and to sort it. And that's it. That's right. <laughs> Um, so I live uh, in the southwest part of the Peak District in a, a little village called Warslow, um, and uh, I've become interested in this by uh, researching the history of my local church, uh, which I knew had strong connections with a gentleman called Sir Thomas Wardle, uh, who lived in the um, second part of the, the 19th century. Um, and it's not really just Sir Thomas, it, it's, uh, his whole family is involved in this. Um, Thomas Wardle was an industrialist. He was a silk dyer and printer from Leek. Leek at this time was a, an important silk town. Um, uh, and he came from a, a, a long line of silk, uh, silk um, dyers. Um, he chose Leek for, uh, for his company because of the very pure waters of the River Churnit, which rises and flows through the Peak District, has particular qualities that he needed for his dyeing. Um, so uh, Sir Thomas, um, as well as being um, uh, a silk dyer, he was interested in a whole range of things. He was interested in archaeology, um, uh, in uh, fossils, in geology, and he was one of these people who everything he, he turned to, he did really well. Um, and so he, he did an awful lot more than, than just deal with silk. Um, he was particularly interested in a particular type of Indian silk called Tassa silk. Um, and he imported this from, from India and he then proceeded to dye it uh, and to print it. It was very, very difficult to dye because of the nature of the silk. It had a, a very uh, strong gum substance around it to protect it. And the Indian dyers had found it very difficult, to, and mostly the way it came to Britain was in it, um, its undyed state. So Sir Thomas wanted to work, well he was Thomas, he wasn't Sir at this time, but he, he wanted to work on this silk. And um, he devised a way of removing that, uh, that substance so that he could dye it, and over many years he perfected his dyes. Um, very gradually, so that he, he got this, the colours that he really wanted. And um, these were very beautiful, rich um, gem colours and very beautiful pastel colours as well. Um, so he really wanted to, not just to have this expertise for himself, he wanted to share his own knowledge with Indian dyers and printers. And um, he was asked, because of his specialist knowledge, by the government to um, carry out some more research into Indian dyeing and, and printing methods. So he sent all over India for samples. And um, from his base in Leek, he carried out research into all these samples about what methods Indian dyers and printers were using. Um, in, in their own environment. And he spent seven years doing this and uh, produced a, a, a book at the end of it. And this was the time, and it was mentioned earlier, uh, it was the time of great exhibitions, um, international exhibitions of, of uh, goods from all over the world. And in 1886, I'm not very good at dates, but I think it was then, uh, was the Colonial and Indian Exhibition. And Thomas Wardle, because of his expertise, was put in charge of the Indian section, and the Indian section was to be mainly about silk. So he was uh, asked to go to India and to collect samples, which uh, he was very excited about, uh, because he'd done all this research, but he hadn't actually been, so he got the chance to go to India. And as well as collecting samples, he was asked to carry out some research as to why the silk industry in India was in a state of decline. It, it had been quite strong, but was declining. Um, so he, um, he travelled quite widely uh, in India when he went um, 
and spent a lot of time in Bengal and Bihar. Uh, he also travelled, he, he, got a, he got a free rail pass. Uh, he made very good use of it, I think. Um, so from Bengal and Bihar, he, uh, he travelled over to Lahore um, and to Peshawar and um, I think a bit further north uh, as well. And all this time he was collecting his samples, but he was also, particularly in Bengal and Bihar, meeting with the silk dyers and printers and discussing with them how they could improve their, their production. And he found that um, the reeling techniques that, that the Indian um, workers were using were were not very effective and he thought he could he could improve this because he had carried out a lot of research um, in, into this and he could help them um, he found also that uh, the um, the silkworm eggs were were dying because of disease and he thought he could uh, a research institute were, would help eradicate that problem. And the other main problem was that the um, Indian landowners were charging far too much money to their tenants uh, for their mulberry trees. So um, he went back to Britain, um, went back to Leek, and called all his industrialist friends together and told them about his findings because he was so enthusiastic and um, produced the recommendations for the government. And he wanted state intervention um, into the silk industry, with, and that didn't go down very well with the government because they wanted free enterprise. Um, but um, he made a lot of recommendations, but the government were really quite cold about this. Um, and uh, he, I, th I think he really got very disillusioned kept on leaving, kept on pushing them. I think he was in real pain and they backside as far as the government was concerned. But eventually, the, the one concession to him, um, they agreed to train a young Indian um, in silk dyeing production methods. And they sent him to uh, all the best experts in France and um, Italy and he actually worked under Oscar in, in Paris. He went back to, uh, to Bengal and put his expertise to good use and, and had some success in, in reviving the industry there. And if you, uh, if you Google Tussa Silk, you will see that there are still some, some centers of Tussa Silk production. Um, there were other things that Wardle did. He sent over machinery and he was horrified to find that uh, this was put into a museum in Calcutta instead of going to the places where it should go to. So he, he was really, I think, you know, deeply upset about this. But he continued, he continued his work. And all the time that this go was going on, his wife, Elizabeth Wardle, didn't spend much time with her feet up either. Um, she was a very skilled embroiderer. Um, and she, um, using the silks that her husband had produced and dyed, she started her own uh, school of embroidery, which became known as the League Embroidery Society, and, and produced uh, embroidered silk, tussa silk, of course, um, for uh, religious purposes and uh, for the home as well. And you can still see many of these examples of her absolutely <coughs> incredibly beautiful um, work uh, in churches in this local area of the Peak District. And there is an exhibition uh, this year based in Leek, which um, I can give some more information about. So Elizabeth was Again, she was promoting this tussle silk through her own, own embroidery. Um, the exhibition was a great success. There was more demand for this type of silk, which meant it was more important for um, Wardle's ideas to, to filter through. 
Um, he continued his interest in, in India, and uh, in 1904 he had the chance to make uh, another trip, this time to Kashmir. Um, he was in his 70s by this time, um, and, and his wife had died, but um, again he got another free red pass and uh, travelled to Rawalpindi, uh, which was as far as he could go on the train, and then he had four days on a Tonga to get to Kashmir, and I think he, he stopped at uh, Jammu and Srinagar. Um, and his ideas, which he had developed from his visit to Bengal, had already taken effect there. Um, a, another person had been employed within the Kashmiri silk industry, and already this was starting to have great benefit. Uh, when Wardle arrived there, he found there were um, 50,000 uh, people involved in silk production and silk dyeing. Uh, in Kashmir, and um, he was very pleased to know that only, only five of them were European. So this had really benefited the, uh, the local people there. Um, so he came, again, he came back to Leek and told everybody in Leek about what he'd been doing. Um, all this was while he was uh, managing three, uh, three factories. Fortunately, he had a lot of help because he had a very big family. Um, he had 14 children, um, didn't sit around a lot, I don't think, uh, had 14 children, they didn't all reach out, but, but they, many of them uh, came into, into his business. And, and this was really, he saw this as his, uh, it was his life's mission, um, and, and his, his interest was in India and in promoting the, the beautiful Tassa silk. Um, and uh, he wrote at the end of his life that, um, you know, he, he, it had been disappointing that he, he couldn't achieve what he had uh, set out to achieve, but he, he still said uh, that he cherished what he had achieved in it. That's about all. <laughs> Beautiful area, um, and come see our embroideries. Yeah,